Leslie Margarita, welcome to Cultural Attaché. <gasps> Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am too. I am too, because I've seen a lot of your work. I, I, of course, saw you in Matilda. Oh. I've seen you in various shows around town in Los Angeles. And you are an Olivier Award winner, which is a Crazy. very exciting thing to say, right? It's very exciting and also cuckoo. Mm -hmm. Also cuckoo that the show hasn't played in the States, but that's another uh, thing altogether. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing this holiday spectacular at Pasadena Playhouse, and it seems as though all the details about this show are being carefully kept under lock and key. Like I couldn't get the publicist to tell me anything about this show, mm -hmm. you know, except that Sam Pickleton is the co-creator and director and that the mm -hmm. four of you are in the show. So mm -hmm. given how little I know and the public knows about this show, how much did you know when you were first approached by the Pasadena Playhouse about being part of their holiday spectacular? Not a thing. All I knew, they, I love the Pasadena Playhouse and I live in Pasadena. It's my favorite place to work. It's, you know, it's an incredible theater. So when the artistic director, Danny Feldman, <laughs> reached out to me, he said, holiday show, Sam Pinkleton, who I had wanted to work with forever. And he said, <laughs> and it, it may or may not be this way, but he said, the concept right now is <laughs> curtain up you on an empty stage. <laughs> and I said, in, in. <laughs> Absolutely. So we knew nothing about it. Then more details trickled in. Um, you know, I, I would do anything for this theater. So I was actually supposed to be doing something else this month in another city. And as soon as this came in, I was like, <laughs> to be home at this theater in December, perfect. And to work with Sam. So we knew nothing. Uh, and then I knew the three other actors who were phenomenal. And that was enough for me to say yes. Uh, and we really didn't know anything until the first day of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And you probably know a lot more now since you're 10 days away from opening. Correct. We know a lot more now. We're still keeping a, a lot of it a secret. I can tell you that spectacular is a, a loosely used term for this show, um, but it is hysterical, it is heartwarming, and is probably not what you think it's gonna be. <laughs> well, I, well, I wanna go there with you about, about okay. this, because mm -hmm. when I looked at the website and refreshed my memory this morning about what the Pasadena Playhouse is saying, there was only one thing that disturbed me, <laughs> knowing that it's Sam Pinkleton, and knowing that you and George and others are involved in this show, it said it was appropriate for children six years and older. And I was sort of, <laughs> sort of hoping there was at least a one in front of the six. That actually was very surprising to all of us involved, but it is family friendly. Uh, I will tell you though, in rehearsal, uh, there, there should be a designated person just to be like, you can't say that, you can't say that. <laughs> so. <laughs> But it is family friendly. Uh, absolutely. And that, yeah, that was unexpected for me. Holiday shows and, and you know, adult content for me kind of go hand in hand. So I was, I was shocked. Well, and I think Sam likes, Sam is not a traditional director. Correct. Nor choreographer. So Correct. I saw Head Over Heels. I, <laughs> and I fell head over heels for it. I saw it three times. I loved it so much. Um, uh -huh. So it's like I'm. Yeah, I'm I love it too. I, 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 I'm expecting. You know, he, that was everything in the kitchen sink thrown in on a very low budget. So. Oh, I, that is exactly what you're gonna get. <laughs> exactly what you're gonna get. I can say what they've told me. I'm allowed to say, is that is it? It's about a holiday spectacular that is coming from another town that has been playing out at out of town tryouts coming to the playhouse and they're the four people involved are the creative team of this holiday spectacular that may or may not arrive on time for the opening night at Pasadena Playhouse. And so what does that mean when a 65 person plus animals flying everything doesn't arrive in time? And what do those four people then have to put on in place of that. 
So though that concept sounds like it would be it would be fairly structured and scripted, it also seems like it affords all four of you tremendous freedom. Does it? Completely. It is very structured, but there is a lot of freedom in it. And that's what makes it so fun. I, I can't keep a straight face when I'm supposed to. Uh, and and so it's going to be wild and fun, but it is very structured. There is uh, a lot of audience uh, interaction and opportunity for the audience to get involved. And then there will also be an actual, uh, each night is a different local group, whether it be a choir or a marching band or a dance troupe. Every night that we're kind of highlighting a local Los Angeles group, which is very exciting as well. Uh, but yeah, well, there's there's plenty of room for hijinks. And uh, it, this has been, the rehearsal process has been exhausting because we're firing on all cylinders. And by the end of the day, we're all just mentally fried because there's so much that we want to do. And there's only four people. <laughs> and there's only so much time. There's only so much time. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've, we've pretty much got it down now. And now we need the the elements, which is audience members, set pieces that may or may not stay standing, you know, things like that. Well, and you're, how will you know if what you're doing is really fully working until you have an audience? I assume you'll have an invited dress at least. Yeah, we, we have enlisted the Pasadena Playhouse staff who very <laughs> reluctantly have come in and been our bodies for us and people um you never know and i've done audience participation shows before whose holiday another christmas show was very heavy reliant on audience and that's part of the fun because you don't know what these people are going to say you don't know how they're going to react and that is part of the fun but that is that's a huge variable um the other stuff we're we're pretty confident that things will work and if they don't we Sam will be around the whole time and we'll be changing it. So if you see it one night, you'll probably see a different show if you come back. <laughs> Slightly is, like different things. So the, this is a show that isn't going to get formally frozen at any No, point. no, never. It will, it will always be fluid. And I love that. Uh, and again, like if you see it a different night, you'll see it totally different. <laughs> so depending on who's there, what group, what group is there, what audience members are there, what we're doing is different every night. So what are the challenges for you as a performer in a show like this? I mean, you only had 14 performances. And I remember a friend of mine having a conversation with Patti Lapone about Patti appearing in an opera at LA Opera, The Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni. And Patti asked my friend, when did you see it? She goes, oh, I saw it opening night. She goes, oh, that's too bad because I didn't know what the F I was doing in that show until the last performance. Totally true. Totally I mean, true. I mean, I think, you know, the hard thing for me is I am portraying the director of this piece. And so the, the tough thing for me is I'm kind of the cat wrangler <laughs> for the whole thing. So I have very clear points as to where we need to go and what needs to happen. So that's the hardest thing for me is <laughs> not wanting to get carried away. I need to keep things going. <laughs> And that's a tough job for me because if something's funny, I'll want it to go on forever. But it, it really is kind of the same as, as Miss Patty says, you, we won't really know. We'll get a few runs in, but those first few shows are going to be very telling and very fun because I think that's when we really find out what is going to happen. So I think by the end of it, we'll, we'll probably be pros at it, but I actually prefer not knowing what's going to happen because that's really where all the, the great like nuggets come from. So, so portraying a director, are you mm -hmm. able to channel all the many directors with whom you've worked into this character that you're going to be providing us on screen or on stage rather? Oh, correct. And I really hope they don't recognize themselves in it because <laughs> correct. Everyone that we have worked with or have stories about informs these characters. There's a director, a stage manager, a costume supervisor, and a, a crew member. So all of these people that we love and adore, are, we're kind of lampooning, uh, absolutely. It's very waiting for Guffman. It's very 
we're kind of skewering other major cities, holiday spectaculars, uh, you know, with, with all the major sets and everything, but it's very waiting for Goffman meets kind of everything goes wrong. <laughs> Which sounds like yeah. fun. So will it's Matthew work will Matthew Warkus find his find his way through this? I love him, but there there I mean every director has something strange about them that oh that we all remember. So there there, there are parts of, of everybody in it, but mine is is definitely a, an an over the top version of a few people that I know. Well now you've you haven't been working with Sam Pinkleton for that long, but is will Sam find his way into this show as well? Sam is this entire show. <laughs> he is the most genius. And for years, people had said, you guys must know each other. You must have worked together. And we haven't. And we've been trying and trying. And this was the perfect kind of introduction for us both to work together. And now I kind of don't want to ever work with anyone else. <laughs> He's well, genius. And his, his, he is all over this. Right. Well, it's, and it's interesting because there's an overlap amongst all of you. Like you and George have both done Little Shop of Horrors. The other two cast members have both done Sunday in the Park with George, but not with George Salazar. Correct. <laughs> we have all overlapped, but never actually been in the same show. We all, you know, theater is such a weird thing. You kind of know everybody. It's a very small community. And even if you haven't met someone in person, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I saw them at this thing. And, you know, you all cross paths. Um, it's very like high school in that way. So we kind of all knew each other. Um, Jason, Michael Snow and I had done, you know, benefits together where we're not singing together, but you're in the same event and, and all, you know, for everybody. So when we got here, we felt like we knew each other, but this is the first time that all of us and Randy Blair, the other genius uh, co-creator, it's the first time we've all actually been in a show together. And that's really exciting. And that was part of, I think all of us saying yes, we're these people. <laughs> right. Now, most holiday shows, and if I'm thinking about the, the ones that happen in other cities, a lot of them mm -hmm. involve long legs. Mm -hmm. um, yes. They involve yeah. snowfall. They Absolutely. involve the inevitable appearance, inevitable appearance of Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And they usually revolve around the same 12 or 14 holiday songs that we all mm -hmm. know and love. Mm -hmm. Can you assure me and anybody who's watching this video that we are not going to be subjected to the very same songs that are in every show everywhere around the world. I can absolutely assure you that. You are going to get a version of all of those things, of the long legs and the snow falling and the Santa appearance, but you will not be hearing those same songs. What Sam and Randy did was they pulled some deep cuts that are incredible. And if you do hear Mm, a couple of those same old chestnuts, they, I guarantee you, have never done been done like this <laughs> before. So no, you're not going to be subjected to the same, I don't want to say tired, but the same old holiday spectacular. But you're you're getting the if if for some reason you wanted to see, you know, a chorus line of reindeer, you you may get that. It just may not be how you think it's gonna be. So when you said chestnuts, these are not the ones roasting on an open fire. Correct. <laughs> Again, show for the family. Show for the family. Well, you know, unfortunately, Shane McGowan of the Pogues just died, and he had a they had a great Christmas song. I know. You want to talk about a deep cut? There you go. Actually, no, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, these are these are some some deep cuts, but there are some. I will say very, you'll still get the same kind of warm, yay, holiday feeling. And, you know, for us, the most important thing is the world's on fire. People want to laugh for, for you know, it's 75 minutes, like, or however long it is. Like, people want to laugh. And this is going to make you forget about anything else for a bit, which is just what we want. Well, and, and of course, now I'm thinking back on the fact that it's appropriate for kids six and older. So I know that the Tom Waits Christmas song is not going to be a part of this. No, that is, that is not. You know. <laughs> and, you know, there, it's kind of like, um, like Looney Tunes. If there is something that is more adult skewed, it's going to go right over the kids' heads. You know, even my favorites, the Muppets, are, are it's for adults. <laughs> and kids get out of it what they get out of it. So if there is anything that is um, skewed that way, it goes right over their heads. Yeah. <laughs>
you, I hope. Yeah, well, you'll find out. It depends on the number of complaints. We'll find out. The complaints that the Pasadena Playhouse And then it'll be cut, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't you do like a G-rated version at the matinee and adult version at, at, and in the evening shows? Well, I'm sure we could. Honestly, you know, I doubt there's going to be a six-year-old there. But if there is, then that's going to be a really fun show. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is uh it, it is i will say it's for the family but if you are looking something that's not looking for something that's not completely family friendly this is it for you as well <laughs> so so for you as a performer what are the challenges of doing a show that you know is more review like in nature no matter how structured it may or not be it's still not a book show ultimately is it no uh for me, the challenge is, is the variable. Um, it's a challenge, but it's also the most fun part. Um, it's the most frightening part, but variable of what will change night to night, what the audience members that choose to participate, what are they gonna be? You know, I, again, like sometimes you get an audience member and you go, oh no, oh no, why, why did I pick this person? I'm stuck with them, you know? And then you have to kind of change up your, show trajectory um that's the hardest part but the most exciting part is is the variable and and also being we have to be we're so serious about this the, the way that those christopher guest characters always are we are very serious about this so the hardest part is going to be not to laugh at ourselves and not to laugh at what's happening because this is very serious business for these four people especially my character so that's going to be the hardest part is not laughing myself. But yeah, the, the the variables that change, but it also keeps it fresh. So are you the one most likely to corpse on stage? Always, always. I am very well known in my community for that. It, it, once I'm out, it is a disaster. I I, I have it down where I can turn up stage uh, very often in a in a performance. I love. I just. I, you know, and people are gonna be like, oh, you should be in the show. I sure I am, but but I love actors, and when my friends make me laugh, it's very tough for me to not react. <laughs> so if you see me turn up stage, you know that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't intentionally have her back to us, but no. <laughs> but it just needs we need it at this moment. <laughs> so Tell me what working with Sam is is like because I you know I interviewed him and Jenny when they did Head Over Heels and I had such a great time talking to them. Um, and I'm thinking this man has such a, a idiosyncratic vision, mm -hmm. and here he is choreographing Stephen Sondheim's last musical at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's like it feels like he runs the gamut from very professional, refined, finessed to anything goes and I'm not referencing Cole Porter here. Correct. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that was one of the things that we had in common is doing these crazy, big, huge, broad things. And then also, we both also do these very like dramatic or, or serious things. And I think I haven't really met another person that has the giant swings like I do <laughs> that much. Um, the thing that that struck me about Sam was he's very much like Peter Darling who choreographed Matilda. In the I was a fan of his movement before I saw anything that he directed because his his choreography isn't really choreography. It's it's movement that comes from the actual truth of what the story is, which is very much Peter Darling, and that's why his movement is so cool and different. And so I was such a fan of that. And then when I met him, I was like, oh my God, we're both Muppets. He loved, you know, anything that is kooky and fun. His brain is crazy. And I think that's why I kind of gravitated towards him because it is, he's the kind of person where you go, I have no idea what's going on in that head, but I know that it's incredible. And I just have to trust what he sees out there is going to work um, because it always does. I just think he's so different from everybody. And when he does those serious things, when he does like Sondheim's last musical, there is still that like out of left field <laughs> idea that nobody else would have thought of. Um, and that there are very few 
directors and choreographers, honestly, because the, the business model of Broadway doesn't allow for that so much anymore. Um, so it's very exciting to do something that isn't under the, the microscope of New York, which is why Pasadena is so amazing. They get these incredible people to create new things that don't have to make gazillions of dollars every week. So somebody like Sam, you know, I can't wait until he gets to do a giant, a giant musical like, but even like Natasha Pierre was, it's incredible what he does. So um, I think it was more, uh, he has free reign here, which I'm sure is exciting for him. It's exciting for us to be able to just go because, you know, theater is a business. And I feel like Pasadena and Los Angeles is one of the few places that is still allowed to try things. Or is still open in the case of the Mark Taper Forum. Or still open. I mean, I, I've been an LA girl forever. I'm from California and there was so much more theater when I was coming up, even from college. And, and it's, it's a sad, it's a sad state. So I'm hoping that things will be rebuilding. And I feel like shows like this are um, so important, not just for, to make people happy, but also to, to create a brand new show that has never been done before that will probably never happen again, because it is such a like special thing that could only happen once, um, I think is so important for theater makers around the world to go, no, there's important theater and great theater to be made everywhere, not just New York. And how important do you think that is for the theater community, for there to be shows that can only be done once instead of this desire for everything to be part of a bigger machine? I think it's so important. I really do. And again, that that is, you know, the one thing that disappointed me about Broadway was how, how corporate it was. Um, and I understand it. I understand people have to make money, but what is cool about doing shows out here or regional theater, it's so special to create something just once in a capsule. Not everything has to transfer. Not every off-Broadway show has to go to Broadway. There, there are special things about shows that just exist in a certain amount of time that that people at the top of their game create because we have to keep doing that. Otherwise, we will just be stuck with stagnant shows that tour for years and years and years and never change. We have to keep we have to keep pushing the boundaries. The show is definitely pushing boundaries in in the best ways. And that's why, you know, it's unfortunate that that theaters across the country, regional theaters are struggling and, and have to program things that are audience old chestnuts again. But what I love about Pasadena is they don't do that. Or if they do, they've completely changed that old chestnut into something brand new. Um, As they just I'm, did with Inherit the Wind. Correct. And they're always doing that. And Danny Feldman, the artistic director who I've known forever and, and love is so amazing for going, okay, well, maybe we could do this musical, but completely change it up. And it doesn't, it's not a, then we could take it to Broadway. It's never that. <laughs> it is for this community. And, you know, if we, something weird happens where they go, oh no, we want to bring it somewhere great, but it's not built for that where, you know, a lot of these out of town theaters are this has to has to transfer or it's it's no good or whatever. And and that's where it gets dangerous because that's where it becomes vanilla. Well, or particularly when it transfers just because there's an expectation that it should and not a real artistic or even commercial reason why it does. Correct. Yeah. I won't Correct. name the I won't name the theaters, but there are a couple in this state that seem to be chronic providers to Broadway of shows that don't do well, which is unfortunate. Correct. Correct. And that when you immediately take, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but when you take something that, that transfers and doesn't, that's also a hit on our artistic community because then people don't want to try something again because it will fail and they'll lose money. And it's just, you know, it's a never ending cycle and we all understand it. We're all part of it and we all want shows to run, but um, you know, it seems these days with ticket prices and, and, with uh, you know uh, financial nuts that these shows have to keep hitting, it's it's getting more and more difficult, and I'm not sure how to rein that back except to do things like this. <laughs> and, well, and, to... wouldn't the, and wouldn't the ultimate irony be that this becomes a show 
that goes to all these other cities, you know, the same yeah. way your Christmas story, the musical is right. like finds yeah. a city to anchor in each year. Yeah. I mean, it's also what I loved about um, whose holiday we did once off Broadway and I would love to bring it here. Uh, and, you know, it's been done a few times, but it is one of those things where you're like, you're like, no, that was so special. And now maybe other cities can do it, but it doesn't need to be a Broadway staple or a, yeah, I, I love that. I love that Christmas story is here at the Amundsen and it's an LA cast for the most part. It's, you know, and that in itself is gonna make it different than what it was on Broadway. So no, I I, I love that these things exist, you know, the, even like uh, any regional theater production. I love regional theater because I get to do these roles in a different way that maybe I wouldn't be hired for <laughs> in New York. And it's, it's, it's really important. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled that we're doing a brand new <laughs> show well, in like well, 10 days. Right. In, in 10 days, for 10 days. For 10 days, yeah. <laughs> um, I do have to ask you one question about Matilda because yes. I, I first saw the show in London um, okay. and then saw it in New York and then saw it twice in Los Angeles. And the mere mention of when I grow up can bring me to tears in all, almost like that. Yep. How do you get through a thousand performances without that song impacting you or can you? No, uh, I mean, it's pretty well documented how much I love that show and how grateful I was to be a part of it. Um, my, the way that my track was, I could watch revolting children every single night from the back of the house because I made an entrance and I did for over a thousand performances, watch it every single night. Had I been able to see when I grow up, I don't think I would have been able to go on after because watching that every night there is a, um, we do, a, a, we had a bunch of pre-checks for the shows, for the kids, the sets and the, you know, the, and the swing check was part of it. And I would always watch it and just ball, even just in rehearsal clothes, watching people do it, because it is just what Tim wrote and that, that whole team, that set design, that moment of the swings is so incredible. Yeah, I, I cried often. And the most I cried were when I knew some of these kids were leaving and it was their last time on the swings was, something that I dreaded every few months when the kids got too big because it was just when I grow up and you knew these kids were growing up and they couldn't be part it was just a whole thing so I was a blubbering mess um the whole time and and I I just I, I don't think I'll ever do a show like that again and I'm so so grateful that it took me so long <laughs> to get to Broadway but it was that show it was just incredible. And I, I, yeah, I, my, I lucked out. I really did. Yeah. See, I lose it every time the adults take over the swings. That's, oh. the, that's, that's, that's the moment. That's the, what, and it's I like, finally, it's, finally it's, got to do it on the final day. They let me on the swings <laughs> it's, and there's a picture of my face. It's just like it's the, best, <laughs> the best moment. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. Um, do you have that picture? I can find it. Can you, you have my email. Can you email? Cause I would uh -huh. love to include that in the print version of this. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. That would, that would be great. So I have one last question for you and it's a little mm -hmm. bit cheesy. I have to admit, oh, um, not cheesy. but, but, you know, we're living in, in a, a troubled world. I think it's safe mm -hmm. to say, you know, tr theaters having its troubles, getting people back in, we're all having huge problems getting together. If you could have one wish for the holiday season for 2023 going into 2024, um, well, I could think of one that probably wouldn't be the right thing to say, but for some people, but but what would what would it be? What are your what what would you like to see this holiday season bring that is different than previous holiday scenes seasons? I mean, peace is the obvious answer, but I, you know, I find that we're just more divided now than ever, and I I, I think. So I'm not really sure what the what what's the opposite of of that would be. I I guess just peace and finding a way to coexist, <laughs> finding a way to let people be who they are. And you know, I it's always very much for me like stay in your lane. If you don't like the way someone lives their life, 
that's okay. I don't need to hear about it from you because it's not your life. Live your life and let someone else live there. So I don't know. I, I get it's all of that. It's all of that, but for sure, peace, because it's, it really feels like the world is on fire. And after having 14 days, well, and, and several weeks of, of Christmas around you, you know, sort of infiltrating every moment of your waking day, are you planning on celebrating the holidays by doing anything but Christmas? <laughs> I, we run until the 23rd and, uh, I'll probably just be sleeping through the holidays. <laughs> no, I, you know, I always celebrate with, with my family uh, up north. So I think I'm going to make my husband <laughs> drive. <laughs> and I'll just conk out with my dog in the back. Uh, no, I definitely will celebrate. I, you know, this, this show is not, is, is all holidays, by the way. So even if you don't celebrate Christmas, you, there is probably... I'm going to say we cover all of them. <laughs> we cover all of all of the Christmas-esque holidays, Hanukkah. We cover, you know, everything. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think I'll celebrate, but be exhausted. I'm sure I'll be exhausted. Well, at least if you if you conk out on the drive, you'll you won't miss the boring parts of the five freeway going up north. <laughs> I know. I do it so often, and. And it's like my dog is always conked out in the back. And the only time he wakes up, there's a stretch of just cows and it just smells like cow poop. And that's the first time it's like, oh, this is my favorite part of the ride. So let me out. So let, let me out. Let me go chase some cows. <laughs>